The main function of a metering device serves two basic principles. One, it creates a pressure drop. Two, we can control flow. And the two of them kind of correlate into one another. So the number one thing for our refrigeration effect to even happen is we have to create a pressure drop from our high to low side in order to get the pressure low enough to where we can get our saturation low so that we can generate um, a cooling effect. Otherwise, the compressor just rotates refrigerant at a constant rate without just like any any physical other effect happening other than we're just moving refrigerant around. Whereas when we create that pressure drop and we reduce pressure from you know that high pressure side where we're trying to reject heat to our low pressure side where now we're trying to take heat back in, well, ultimately, yeah, your metering device is meant to do that, is your pressure drop device that enables our refrigeration effect on the low end. As a effect of creating a pressure drop, it also allows us to have a bit of flow control. Now, on the most rudimentary scales, the flow is not variable, so we have fixed flow which then the actual flow through the device is dependent upon the load and like where, where our capacity is for the machine. So that's going to be a fixed orifice of some kind. So with a fixed orifice, and there's a few different styles out there, the orifice is not adjusting anything. It's just responding to whatever the load conditions are at the time. So it's a, it's a very basic level of things, but there's not any real control. And that's where, with these chiller systems, we need, especially for us to perform at our best efficiencies, we needed to move into actual variable control. Now, it's not that we still use fixed orifices all over, like train CVHs are still produced to this day very heavily. And so they still have a fixed orifice in them. But trains also got a pretty good setup to where it just it works for them and it's efficient enough and they've put variable speed drives and, and, uh, on their motors now and like they've got their whole setup. But the majority of systems are going to have some sort of variable valve, whether that's a variable orifice uh, or a, specifically an EXV. Now a TXV, while it's a it's a variable flow, so TXVs are rated to be able to unload to a certain point. So a 50-ton valve um, can derate itself to typically, like a, the spoiling valves can go as low as 30% of their total capacity. So once you get, once your um, amount of refrigerant you're flowing through there is less than 30% of what that valve is capable of doing, well now it's it's too much and the valve can't keep up which is one reason why in in a lot of cases we go with two and we split the valve in half and we do two uh, identical valves so instead of 50 tons we'll have two 25 ton valves and those will share and those two 25 ton valves at the minimum loads we can derate those valves flow of uh, to down low enough to meet our minimum operating uh, um, uh, parameter for the cooling system, which is something that the, the the one larger valve couldn't do. It's also more expensive. So the bigger the valve, the more expensive it gets. Whereas if you get you get these two smaller standard valves, not only do we get a lower capacity control with them, but we also can get a um, a, a cheaper overall part at a higher volume and that part is more likely to be usable across machines so you have a smaller skew for this whole uh, parts and inventory that you have to carry at that point because it's more universal uh, and, and, and multi uh, multi system anyway with T with TXVs though while they can derate we don't have direct control of them which is hinders how much we can do with it which is really where the the chiller industry just went headlong into exv technology because we have complete control of exactly what's happening and we can treat those those uh the, the metering device as a shutoff valve 
because most of our EEVs out there have the ability to completely cut flow at their fully closed state, which is really convenient. And now we're talking, we have the ability to eliminate uh, additional, say, um, um, solenoid valves and stuff because the EEV can do the job when it's functioning properly, obviously, but it can do that job. So that's where we, ha we get into the variable flow state. And now we can very precisely tune our flow in a few different ways. We could be the two main ways are either going to be superheat or they're going to be liquid level. And by superheat, I'm not just meaning suction superheat. A lot of machines will control their valves based off of discharge superheat off the compressors. And then some of them will function off of suction superheat. Or I say some of them as if that's a low number. It's a it's it's a it is a split between the industry whether they go discharge superheat or whether they go suction superheat if one had in any place over the other i would venture to say that we have more machines that monitor suction superheat than discharge but that's not always the case so we, we do both ultimately we do both and in, in a lot of these cases it's much easier to monitor discharge superheat especially if we have an economizer in the mix than it is to monitor suction superheat. On the refrigerant level side though, uh, kind of like we talked about with the refrigerant level sensors, it could be either condenser or evaporator. And we actively see it used in both applications. And at that point, it's just a matter of adjusting our valve to fit that. And that's where the variable orifice comes in. And I'm gonna do a deeper dive into each of these valve styles, but whether it be EXV or variable orifice, the great part to variable orifice is you can get, it's basically, it's a, it's a modified butterfly valve, or at least the, the ones I'm referencing, the, like what York uses. So it's not a standard butterfly that you're gonna pick up off the shelf. It's a modified butterfly, but it's a butterfly valve. And we can get much higher uh, total volume through that valve than we can get with a uh, a standard EXV. And that's why, like in some cases, uh, I'm thinking of like an RTHD here, we have to have a dual valve block. There's a block mounted to the evaporator, and this is for the larger tonnages, so I'm thinking, what, what, two, three hundred and up, where these are big EXVs to begin with, and then we have to run two of them in a, in a solid block assembly mounted on top of the evaporator in order to get the flow control that we need. And so to get around that, York just implemented a, um, uh, that variable orifice style, that butterfly style, which gives us a lot of ability to scale the, the size of our metering device to fit the capacity of the machine that we have. It's a really, really smart way, in just my opinion, I think of trying to achieve that task and simplifying it. Because at that point, that, that valve just has an, a standard actuator on it. Whereas, you know, the EXV is obviously a much more complicated head assembly. That is the core fundamental of what our metering device needs to do. We need to create the pressure drop so that we can take heat in. We also need to control flow, uh, whether that's controlling flow to a superheat, whether that's controlling flow to a level sensor. Either way, we need to control flow and we need to have proper control of where the refrigerant is in our system and how we're utilizing it based off of how we're designed to.